to begin. I, I hopefully everyone's back in the auditorium uh, after the meal, and uh, uh, my dessert was good. Mm. Uh, if we do have any visitors that have uh, showed up, and I don't see any around, but if you have, and, and I don't acknowledge you, uh, if you will fill out a visitor's card, which we tell all of our visitors to do that, uh, so that we can have a record of your attendance. And also, too, if you turned your, your noisemaker on when you went down to eat, uh, turn it off now so you won't be interrupted. Uh, Jason's going to be uh, giving us the first presentation, and then I'm assuming Rocco and then uh, John. Uh, so that would be the order that we're going to be doing that in just a few minutes. Uh, they're going to come up, and, and uh, we're going we're gonna, to, at nine and a half minutes, we're going to shut off a buzzer. And so they'll, so they'll uh, especially on John, so uh, we'll, we'll try to keep them... <laughs> Keep them, keep them on time. So, uh, remember also too. I mentioned earlier uh, that uh, Malcolm was going in the morning. They're leaving in the morning and flying to uh, um, to Houston. To uh, he's got some more tests that he needs to. They need to say so he can be a correctly evaluated on how to further his uh, his treatments and things. And so uh, they're having a lot of anxiety about this. So uh, let's uh, let's remember them in our prayers, especially them. Uh, also, too, as made made known a little bit earlier that uh, uh, Jimmy had, had Jimmy Barr had had a couple of rough nights, and uh, maybe the next day or two he'll he'll start doing a whole lot better. So, and let's also remember the Oxley family as they're going through the uh, the loss, loss of uh, Buddy's uh, mother. Uh, Hannah Broom is uh, going for another test this week, and uh, so let's remember her in, in uh, our in, in our prayers. Also, too, I was told that Heather Nettles had a seizure this morning during the services, and so uh, they're not here this afternoon. I, I haven't had the opportunity to check on them yet, so uh, we, <clears throat> we need to keep that in them in our prayers. So I think that's uh, all we have. Uh, Drew will lead us in a couple of songs. We'll have a prayer, and then we'll get through with our following our services. Let's, let's, let's open with just a short prayer, and then we'll begin our services. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this, another beautiful day that you provided for us. We're thankful for the fellowship that we can have with one another. It means so much to each one of us to be, make the connections and to, uh, so to see what's going on in each other's life. And it's so important to us to make sure that we're uh, capable of doing the things that we can do. And when we get opportunity to, see, to go out and, and teach the lost, we pray that we would always have that on our mind and have uh, th those who... Uh, uh, we have contacts with that uh, the doors could be open to us so that we can at least plant the seed and and, and we know that you will give the uh, uh, do, do give us to growth where, wherever it's necessary father we thank you so much for the church that worships here and we pray that you'd be with us in these next few minutes as we uh, listen to the guys that are going out into the field and going to the other countries to uh, to preach the gospel and establish congregations so that uh, uh, the world can know and, and understand and love uh, you like we do. Thank you so much for the love that you have for each one of us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Four sixty one. Four sixty one will be the first song this afternoon. Four sixty one. Seeking the lost chest kind of entry.
if you are using the book and want to mark, there will be an invitation song here in a few moments. It'll be 706. 706. We'll sing 380 before we are led in prayer. And then Jason will get up and begin after our prayer. 380. There is a name I love. Our dear and loving Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before your throne at this time, thanking you so very much, Father, for each one of us being able to be here this morning to, to worship and praise your holy name, Father. And we pray as we always do that the things that we did today here, Father, is in spirit and truth and in in give, give you all reverence and glory to your name, Father, and praise to you as you truly deserve. And we're so grateful for allowing us to be here and giving us the well-being to do so. We pray, Heavenly Father, for our brothers and sisters, and we, we know we have many who are sick, but Heavenly Father, we would ask that you be with Malcolm and Sue as they travel, and we pray that, Heavenly Father, that those doctors that are attending to Malcolm, that, to be able to use the wisdom and learning that they have, Father, to, to give him the best advice and help him, Father, and we pray, pray for his problem to be resolved, Father. We pray, Heavenly Father, for Buddy Oxley and his family and for the loss of his mother, and we pray that you'll be with them and help them and comfort them and give them peace that only you can, Father. And we do pray for Hannah Broom as she's fixing to undergo some tests, Father, and we pray that you'll help those doctors that are uh, looking after her, Father, also to use wisdom and knowledge and, and help her with, with her problem, Father, and help all to come out well with that. We pray for Heather, Father, that uh, nettles. Uh, we know that she had some seizures earlier this morning, and we just pray that if she seeks advice from the doctors, that they'll be able to find out what's going on with her, Father, and be able to give her uh, the treatment that she needs to help her with this issues that she has, Father. We have so many others, Father, that, <clears throat> that are in our announcements that are having problems and needs, and we just pray for each and every one that you'll be with them all and be with them the ones that are recovering, Father, and, and help them have a speedy recovery. And, and we pray, that Father, that you'll be with each one and with their problems and needs again, Father. We pray, Heavenly Father, for Nora Sturgeon as she's fixing to get wed, Father, and we just pray that you'll be with her and her, and her future spouse, that uh, bless them, Father, and help them to, to have a, a family, a good family, Father, to raise and be in the church, Father, and, and continue to bless them through their marriage, Father. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with uh, John Pig and the Pierces as they continue to do missionary work, Father. We, we pray that you'll open doors for them and continue to bless them with good health and, and help them, Father, as they are working and trying to spread your kingdom and bring souls to your kingdom, Father. And we just pray that you'll 
again, open doors for them and help them and, and continue to bless them with good health. Father, we do thank you so much for you, for you and your son and the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, Father, and for each what each one does in our lives and for just all the many things that you do for us. And we know each and every day of our lives, Father, is truly a blessing and it help us to just to always be mindful of the things that you do for us and give us so that each and every day that we can glorify you with our lives, Father. We thank you so much again for the love and mercy and grace that you have shown to all of us, Father. We just pray that we'll be those living sacrifices for you. And please forgive us of our sins, Father. And please continue to, to watch out and protect us, Father. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, good afternoon. I am so thankful to be here with you today and to have the opportunity to share just very briefly about the work that we are doing. And I'm speaking on behalf of our, fam our whole family and team. Um, and so I have the privilege, one of the rare occasions, that I get to work with my father and my mother. And uh, so Rocco and Debbie, and then my wife is here, Devin. And then Devin and I have four sons, and uh, two of them will be returning back to the mission field with us. One of them is in college and has been home for a couple of years. The other one is, uh, came home with us this time. He was hoping to enroll in Bear Valley Bible um, Institute in Denver this year, but because of COVID, he wasn't, we couldn't get him on a flight. There was no way to get him back to the U.S., so he's going to be staying behind and working, and Lord willing, will be enrolling in the fall. Uh, so when you look at this picture, um, that's that beautiful sandy beach. It looks wonderful and everything. That's actually Panama City, Florida. Uh, it was taken last week. Uh, so, um, but that was so that we could have the whole family together in one shot. But I am thankful for the opportunity to talk to you about the work that we're doing. If you're not familiar with the work, sure, which one I'm going here? There we go. Uh, we are operating a, um, the Bible Institute at Rewanga. We are an extension program of Bear Valley um, Bible Institute. And so we've been doing this um, a little over five years now. We've been working on it longer, but we've been doing our full-time program for about five years. And what we are is we're a two-year full-time Bible training program. And so in two years, we offer a total of 48 classes um, that our students take during that time. Um, with our new program currently, they have a minimum of 30 hours of in-class instruction per course. Um, and we have three full-time instructors, myself, my father, and then one local instructor now that we brought on in 2019, Brother Mosi Silo, um, who helps. Um, he teaches about three classes a year in our regular program, um, as well as some other things that you'll see um, as we talk about the program. In those 48 classes, what we are interested in doing is preparing our students to share the Word uh, with others. I really appreciated the lesson this morning um, that Brother Gary gave because he used a couple of passages that we often use in our reporting, and particularly 2 Timothy 2, 2 is on our school seal. Um, the idea of training local Christians to take over the responsibility of training new generations. And so that's what we're interested in doing. So our program, uh, we cover all 66 books of the Bible. We are obviously a Bible program, so we want to be rooted in Scripture. But what we're interested in is not just standing up and saying, okay, here's what the Bible says, this is what it means. What we want to do is give them the tools they need to study for themselves, to develop their own lessons, um, and to study for themselves, just as we have had to learn to do uh, through our own education. So in addition to Bible classes, we often we offer other courses to help them have the tools they need. Uh, Bible backgrounds, Bible doctrines, ministry, um, and leadership training classes. But at the end of the day, mission work is about people. And that's what, whoops, wrong way. That's what we were asked to emphasize uh, today is the people and the works that we are doing. And so I want to highlight just a few things. The first thing is we're interested in training leaders. As we talk about people, um, rather than calling it a preacher training school, um, I typically refer to it as a leadership training program. Um, yes, we're training preachers, we're training Bible class teachers, but our goal is to do something much bigger than that. And that is to train leaders to see the church beyond 
this present generation so that a generation from now the church isn't, you know, isn't dead and left wondering what happened. And uh, so we've seen good results from this. And one of the things I want to highlight for you today is uh, we've had 18 graduates so far from our program. Of those 18 graduates, three of them in the last 13 months have been appointed elders of their congregations. In addition to those three men, um, two of them, their wives, have also completed our program. And so five of our 18 graduates are serving either as elders or elders' wives. And so you see them highlighted there. On your left is Brother Mavono. He graduated in 2020. And he's from the village of Della de Manu. He graduated on a Saturday. And on Sunday, his congregation installed him as an elder. And uh, Mavono is in line to eventually become chief of his village. Um, and so he's a very important person. In fact, important enough that the local Methodist church in his village invited him to come and start teaching a class. And so he had been teaching them. And then the leaders of the Methodist church made him stop because he was converting too many of their members. Um, and so this is you know, the kind of people that we have. Um, and then on your right, you've got Brother Amosi, who is our instructor. You've already seen him. And then Brother Lesio. Um, in March of this year, these two men were appointed as elders of the Rewanga congregation where we worship. And uh, what's significant is about two or three years ago, we celebrated our 50th anniversary at Rewanga of the church being there. They had never had elders. Now they have elders, and both of them have been through our program. And so we're not just training preachers, we're training leaders to serve in the kingdom of God. Of course, we are teaching, again, training teachers and preachers as well. And a part of it is teaching them to teach others. And so I told you Amosi teaches in our full-time program. Um, but where Amosi is really shining is actually we started in 2019 a night program. One night a week, Monday night, we have a class. And uh, we offer four to five classes a year in that. And uh, we're running about six students on average to take each one of those courses. It goes up or down, but an average of about six students at a time. And um, Amosi teaches the majority of those classes. In fact, he's taught all but two of those classes. One of the students that he's had is John Nakambea. And the reason I point out John Nakambea, you can see him in the purple shirt there in the center picture um, there on the end. He's sitting there with his wife. John Nakambea, when we moved to Fiji... Um, was a new Christian and very, very shy. Now, he's a big man. He's a good bit taller than I am, and, uh, or seems to be anyway. He's a big guy, and, uh, but he's very soft-spoken. And John Nakambea, about the only thing he would do in worship services, occasionally, if he was asked, he would lead a prayer. And uh, we don't have the technology and stuff. We don't have microphones or anything uh, to amplify the voice. And he would get up there, and he would speak so softly that I'd be sitting on the front row sometimes and could not hear what he was saying. Well, when COVID hit in 2020, um, we were forced to move to house churches for a period of time. We couldn't have assemblies of larger than 20. And so the church, the leaders of the church met, divided the groups up to maintain that, to keep worship services going. Unfortunately, because of the size of John's family, John was the only male Christian in his group. John, who has never spoken, he's never so much as given an invitation in his life, can barely be heard when he leads a prayer. John, who has had just four or five classes, mostly taught by his brother-in-law, Amosi, John has to become the preacher for his home. He had to do this for several months. But when things started to lighten up at the end of last year, um, and we had a break where we were for a while allowed to resume in-person worship, John brought that experience with him. And now, John is a part of the regular preaching and teaching rotation at Rewanga. Now, I would love to take credit for that. But most of the training that John has had did not come for Dad or me. It came from Amosi one of our graduates. And so we're seeing the results. Out of that Monday night program, Dad mentioned in the elders meeting, we had three guys from 
Nandy, about four and a half hours away, decided that they were going to come visit the program and take Dad's class on preaching. For eight weeks, they drove four and a half hours, took three hours of a class, spent the night, and drove back. Used up all their vacation time from work to do this. And so we tried to get them to take another class, and that's when we found out they were taking vacation time. They said, we don't have any more time off. We can't come back. So opportunities were open, and now two Saturdays a week, two weekends a month, Dad and I drive the four and a half hours, and we teach a Saturday program in Nandy um, and Latoka, where we have a total of nine to ten students taking that. Um, and so we continue to train leaders. Here's the end result. is At the end of the day, it's about saving souls. And understanding that Dad and I are two people, there's only so much we can do. We have to train others to do this work. And so we do very hands-on. And this year, we were able to have a workshop right before Delta hit and locked us down. Um, on the North Island, five or six congregations. It wasn't even supposed to be evangelistic. It was supposed to be to encourage the churches there. They had loss of work from COVID. We'd had two cyclones that hit in January and, or December and January, um, destroyed crops. And so they just wanted to be encouraged. We had a workshop there. Nearly all the lessons being taught by the faculty or the students. In one weekend, not an evangelistic campaign, we still had 10 baptisms. And one congregation that had stopped meeting that was restored. Now the restoration of that congregation wasn't done by dad or me. It was done by two of our graduates who worked with them, did benevolence through the storm relief. And most of those ten baptisms were from that congregation. And it's meeting now when it hadn't been meeting in several years. And so the point is to say that this method works. We are interested in training them to do the work, and you are a part of that. And so I want to say thank you from the bottom of your heart or our hearts for that. As they say in Fiji, the Nakavakalevu. Um, thank you very much, and may God bless you. Let the church say amen. amen. I tell you what, that was a great report, Jason. Appreciate that so very much. I don't have a PowerPoint this morning, so uh, I'm going to shoot from the hip. But I want to say to you that are new to the Sowell Road Church, at least in the last several years, that you probably don't know this. But my first connection with the Sowell Road Church was in December of 1964. I was the first person baptized in the new church building, the first church building that was built in Rankin County. And your congregation was responsible for providing the support to Brother Bill Lambert as a missionary to my home county. And, and so I'm a part of your local global outreach ministry going all the way back to 1964. And who would have thought in God's providence that here we are in 20, going into 2021, and I'm back connected even more so with the Sowell Road Church. You have been an inspiration to me for many, many years. In fact, some of you don't know that I almost decided to become your preacher several years ago. I was in Greenwood, Mississippi, and you were moving to a new lo this new location, and you were in need of a preacher. But the problem was, I couldn't come. And the reason was, I had encouraged the church there to get involved in a foreign mission work in Ghana, South uh, 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 South America and to do a building program at the same time and Beth and I had personally made a financial investment in that and I told Beth I said honey if we were to leave and go to Sidewalk Road I wouldn't be able to live with myself the rest of my life because I've encouraged these brethren to get involved in this mission work but anyway I just wanted to give you that little bit of a background hopefully you will appreciate the Sidewalk Road Church even more uh, for what benefit, what, what little blessing that I've been to the kingdom and uh, teaching and preaching over the last 50 years, you are responsible for whatever little good I may have done <coughs> in my life. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart and for my wife also. I, I, I never thought that I would be in the position that I'm in 
uh, working in Mexico, right below our border. Mexico is a, is a country that's the fourth largest country in the world, right below our border. We're talking about a country of 200 million people, and we're working in one state in central Mexico that's over 6 million people. And over the course of the last 21 years, with the Kosciuszko Church and our congregation cooperating together and other churches involved as well, uh, before you uh, became involved, about 15 congregations were established in that state. And we're talking about cities like Leon with 1.7 million people and the capital, Guanajuato, uh, of, of uh, a quarter million people. Celaya, over 500,000 people. Irapuato, over 400,000 people. Uh, we still have 10 cities of anywhere from 30 to 100,000 where there's still no Church of Christ. But we're grateful for the 20 congregations that's been established. 15 of those congregations were established before Lake Harbor Drive took the oversight uh, four years ago. Since that time, we have established five additional congregations. Like uh, Brother Jason and Brother Rocco, our work has some commonality to it in that we have a biblical institute and we are training preachers and, and workers. Every one of our preachers that we now support, there are 10 of them, uh, as well as the other 10 that are now self-supporting and, and living in Guanajuato, are all husbands and wives, graduates of either our institute or some other institute, most of them ours. Most of them were converted right in the state of Guanajuato. Uh, and so this is their home. This is where their family is. And they have such a passion for converting their own people. I can tell you that that passion has translated into our congregations that we planned and planted together with your help. They planted five additional congregations that we didn't even plan. They did it on their own because they've taken ownership of this mission work to evangelize their state. And we're going to probably see that even more as time goes along. I'm grateful that this coming, this month, in fact, we will have two additional congregations become self-supporting. One of those congregations, the preacher is leaving, but he's trained three brothers that will take over the leadership of that congregation. Uh, that's in Irapuato. In Common Fort, the preacher there who was converted there several years ago uh, is now going to become bivocational and stay there. And, uh, and so uh, we've given him the opportunity to move to a new city and help us to start a new work because we're going to start two new works in January, and we're looking for missionaries right now. We don't have anybody in our institute in the wings ready, and, uh, uh, and, and so we're, we're praying that God will open the doors. I want you to be praying about one particular prospect, well, actually two. Uh, one is an elder of the San Miguel Church, which is the first church that we supported. They became organized two years ago with elders and deacons. And Rodolfo is a dear, dear friend of mine. He was converted by Fernando, our director, and his wife. Uh, and um, just a tremendous evangelist himself, as well as elder. He, he goes to a, a, a drug rehab facility and uh, conducts classes with young people. He asked me a year ago to send him some Bibles uh, for, for his use, and we did that. Well, Rodolfo met with Fernando just about a month ago when he knew that we were praying for a new evangelist. And he said, Fernando, I want you to pray for me and Alma, his wife. He said, because we're thinking seriously about resigning as an elder and joining the GOT mission team and becoming a missionary. He's, he's, he's dealing with that right now. And I'm praying that he'll make that decision to become a missionary for us. With his background, with his experience, with his conversion from the state, and, I, and, and I'm just convinced that he'll hit the road running, and we'll see a great work started with him. Uh, there's another prospect that we have. He's now in Venezuela, but he's been uh, teach, studying. His dad is a preacher, 
And he has been studying with his wife in the school of Toluca, Mexico, uh, online. And he's finished. And uh, Fernando graduated from Toluca. And I had told him, I said, call the Toluca School of Preaching. See if you can find us a, a preacher like he did last January with Alejandro and his wife, Alejandra. And they just started a new work in Uridia last January and, and just doing a tremendous uh, uh, growth already, a congregation of about 30 people. And, uh, and, and so here is uh, Jose and Luz. They're wanting to come. They don't have any children. Initially, he wanted to come on a tourist visa and help us start a new work. And our elders said, no, we're not going to do that. But if you will apply for a work visa and then plan to try to get Mexican citizenship after you arrive, then we'll consider moving you from Venezuela to Guanajuato. Well, I don't know if that's going to work out or not, but be praying about uh, Jose and Luz as a possible candidate for us. I want to tell you uh, in the few minutes that I have left, some personal conversion stories that I believe will touch your heart. Let me give you one example. Sergio is our preacher in Joventina Rosa. That congregation is almost on the verge of being self-supporting. In fact, we've already uh, met with him and discussed with him about next December, that congregation becoming self-supporting. And he's ready for it. And he's praying about it. He didn't have anybody trained to take over the leadership, or we would have done that this month. But he's saying, John, give me one more year. So we're going to do that. And... Um, uh, and, uh, and then we're going to give him the alternative either to stay there or to move to a new city. But Sergio was a drunk. He had a terrible marriage, but he was a good businessman. You know people like that in the community? He lived in Mexico City, and he was in the wholesale chicken business, and he heard about the tourist business going on in Guanajuato State in the city of San Miguel, where our biblical institute is, where our largest congregation is located. And so he moved his family to San Miguel, set up his wholesale chicken business. We have a lot of street vendors in, in Mexico, and so the, the street vendors go to him and buy their chicken uh, every week to sell on the street. And uh, there is a sister in the church at San Miguel, among many other sisters and brothers that are trained in personal evangelism, just like you are here. And Fernando is stress personal evangelism constantly in the pulpit, just like Brother Gary did this morning. And so Lupita was, everybody she would meet, she was trying to talk to him about Jesus and, and, and passing out biblical tracts on God's plan of salvation and the true nature of the church. And listen to me, years ago, I heard a preacher tell me at Freed Hardeman, said, John, people who've never heard about undenominational Christianity and who've never heard the true gospel plan of salvation, they deserve to hear it at least one time, much more so than people who hear it every Sunday. Well, that's what we're doing in Mexico. Everybody we talk to have never, ever heard about undenominational New Testament Christianity. And they truly do not know and understand the true gospel plan of salvation. 92% of the people that we work with are Roman Catholic. They believe in Jesus. They believe in the Bible. They believe deeply in God. And so we have an open door. In fact, in the last two years, in spite of COVID... We've had our greatest growth. It's actually open doors. But let me get back to Sergio. Lapita was one of those street vendors. And she went to Sergio's business to buy some chicken. And while she was there, he had several employees working for him. She was passing out tracts to all of his employees, and it was irritating them. And they went to Sergio, and they said, Sergio, you got to do something about that woman from the Iglesia de Cristo in San Miguel. She is bugging us to death with her Bible tracts. And so Sergio, because he was having trouble with alcohol, <clears throat> having trouble with his wife, Anna, having trouble with his children, as your preacher said this morning, and Derek, maybe you said it, I can't remember. Some people need Jesus and don't know it. That was Sergio. <clears throat> and so we went to talk to Lapita. But Lapita was 
a little bit on the aggressive side, personality-wise, and she got the best of Sergio. <laughs> <laughs> she, she convinced Sergio to consider what she was teaching and what she was trying to share with her, his employees. And so he agreed to do that. And so she went and got Fernando. They had set up a Bible study. And for many weeks, they had Bible studies every week in Sergio's home with Anna. One Wednesday night, unknown to anybody, they had a Bible study that night. And in walked Sergio. Walked straight up to Fernando and said, I'm ready to become a Christian. Can you baptize me tonight? And his wife Anna was baptized. And when I asked Sergio about his conversion, he said, John, let me tell you something. When I came up out of that water, God took away my desire for alcohol. And it never has touched my lips since. He and his wife got involved in our in the congregation in uh, San Miguel. Before long, he had a passion in his heart that God was calling him to preach the gospel of Christ. And so he went to Fernando and said, I've decided I want to become a preacher. And so the congregation took up a collection and sent him to Toluca, to the school of preaching there, even though he had had courses at our biblical institute already. And he graduated with honors there. Came back and we sent him to Villa Grande. And uh, Lord willing, next year, that congregation will become self-supporting. Sergio will become bivocational. Or either he will have trained some workers to take over the congregation, or we will send Sergio to a brand new city and start a brand new work. Isn't that great? Let me tell you about Ishmael. Ishmael was also alcoholic. He and, he and his wife, uh, Judy, uh, uh, rather Patty, were having also difficulty. He was having a hangover on Sunday morning coming into Common Fort. The Mexican people who live out in the ranches, they come into the city on Saturday and Sunday to shop. And, 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 and so here he is on Sunday morning and he's going down the street headed toward the Hardin, which is the town center. And he looked up and he saw the sign. He glistened to Cristo. And he looked at, and he looked at his wife and he said, Patty, the devil has had me long enough. Do you want to go in there? And so they walked in there on a Sunday morning and heard Rene Ramirez, one of our preachers, Heard the gospel for the very first time in his life in the truest sense in his own native language. Rene was smart enough as a local preacher to get his name and address and phone number. He went out into the countryside on the ranch where he lived that Sunday afternoon. But on Monday, Rene was knocking on his door. Encouraging him to come back. And so he came back. And then he came again. And then Rene set up a Bible study with him and his wife. One Sunday, they had a baptism. And because our people in Mexico were kind of suspicious, uh, this lady came up out of the baptistry. And, and, uh, and so Ishmael's wife, Judy, went and touched the water. She thought maybe there's something miraculous about that water. Well, it was something miraculous in a sense then that this new creature in Christ had come up out of the waters and it had a spiritual impact on her. And she wanted to have a Bible study right then, but Ishmael didn't, uh, 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 didn't want that. And eventually, though, Rene was successful in setting up a Bible study with him. And he and his wife both were baptized. Well, they were like a sponge trying to learn everything they could. And because we had an extension of our institute in Common Fort, they wanted to get involved in that extension. And before long, they're getting serious about wanting to be missionaries. And so he spoke to Fernando and said, Fernando, I want to become a missionary. Well, we had decided at that point to send Rene to help us start another new work in Salao. And that was going to leave the church wasn't quite ready to be self-supporting because we didn't have anybody quite developed yet, including Ishmael. So we supported Ishmael there for just a little while. 
And then two years ago, we sent Ishmael to Hoventina Rosa, and he grew the congregation leaps and bounds. And then we just last year sent him to Guanajuato City, the capital. He's already had a number of conversions. That's how God has worked through the gospel. It started out with a Christian woman, Lapita, in San Miguel. It led to Sergio's conversion, and now a missionary. It started out with Ishmael coming into town, seeing that sign, Iglesia de Cristo, and finding a warm and friendly and loving invitation to study the gospel of Jesus Christ. Studying in our institute, becoming a missionary. That has been repeated over and over and over again. And you're a part of that, brethren. This congregation has had an outreach locally and globally for years. And I'm so thankful for our partnership in the gospel in Guanajuato, Mexico. We covet your prayers. We've had nearly 100 baptisms this year. We had about 70-something baptisms last year. Uh, we feel that we are now living in the book of Acts in Guanajuato because we're not only spreading the gospel, planting the church in other cities, just like you read about in the book of Acts, training workers and preachers, just like you read about in the book of Acts, churches becoming organized with elders and deacons, and that's the kind of fruitful work that you want to be a part of. To accentuate what Brother Gary had to say this morning, the mission of Jesus was the heart of his purpose. Mission was the heart of Christ. And mission is the, is the hope of the condemned. And mission is the health of the church. You show me a spiritually healthy church, and I'm going to show you a missionary church. The Sawa Road Church is a missionary church. You've got missionary preachers. You've got missionary elders and deacons. Some of you have been to foreign mission works on short term, maybe even long term. You have a tremendous appetite to see souls saved. I told Gary and Derek at a preacher's meeting just the other day, no church in the whole Jackson area has set a passionate example for evangelism, especially this year, like the Sidewell Road Church. We don't come close to the conversion growth that you're experiencing this year because of your revival and commitment to saving souls right here. But thank you, church, for going across the southern border. God bless you. I don't know if it's good going last because was Jason and John, that was incredible. And I hope that as you heard those reports and as you heard just how much is going on in so many places of this world that you're excited about missions, globally, uh, stateside, and right here in Jackson. When this year started, we started out with a theme, a motto of sorts. So we, right here is just one more soul saved. And we enacted a plan that was going to help us grow and help us to not just grow numerically, which is awesome, but to grow spiritually. And the elders helped work that plan, and, and then and part of that was this church becoming even more so evangelistic. I mean, more evangelistic than maybe we, we have been in a long time. And so the year started out great, and we were doing so well, and then we were blessed uh, this past summer with, uh, with Rob Whitaker coming and just helping us, giving us a, really a boost in the arm of what we had already started, and he came and gave us... Uh, some tools and some things we could use. But what we have started this year, and what I hope that we continue ever, every year to follow, is a pattern, is a cycle of spiritual growth and maturity and evangelism. 
And as we look at this today, this, this slideshow here is the evangelism model, and this was sent to me by Brother Whitaker, and I wanted to help share part of this today. We have a lot of things going on here at Silo Road. We have a lot of areas you can be involved with. And every single one of these areas points right to evangelism. And every single thing and every single thing you can do, every part of it points right to the mission of the church. And that's the same mission Jesus had. We're seeking and saving the lost. We're teaching the gospel to those around us. And so you see here things, there might be things even on the screen that you say, well, we don't do those right now. Well, that's okay. We can do them later. Because every single one of these things can point and can give us a tool, can give us a way that we can reach out to the lost. For months now, for months now, we've been trying to continue a cycle, continue a cycle of being a growing church, being a growing church that's trying to make contacts that's trying to find people we can prospect, that's trying to set up Bible studies, that's, that's hoping for and praying for baptisms, that's hoping to have those new converts, and then continuing that cycle of growth. We see as part of that that in these contexts, we've been sending out cards, and we've been collecting information from visitors, and we've been doing anything we can, like sending out house-to-house, heart-to-heart, and so many other things, inviting neighbors and friends to so many of our congregational activities and the boards in the foyer don't even, don't even touch it. We haven't been updated in a little while. Thousands of people have been contacted in person, not even counting the number of contacts you've made digitally and on, and on the web and things like that. We've, made pro, we've started prospecting souls, and we've put the work into these relationships so that these relationships can grow and can get better and better. And we've seen growth come from that because we've had many Bible studies this year. And those Bible studies have led to several baptisms this year, and praise be to God for that. We've seen the new converts class just grow and grow and grow, and it seems like every time we turn around, there's somebody else we were added to that class. And how wonderful is that? And we all continue that cycle of growth and being that growing church uh, that we all want to be. But just as a reminder... We're all to be praying for souls. These are contact cards, and we're supposed to be praying for souls and reaching out for souls day in and day out. That's personal contacts for us as an individual, and then we're turning these names into the congregation so the congregation can have contacts as well. We collect that information. We put them on our congregational contact list, and then we send them cards. We visit them. We try to set up Bible studies in so many ways. All the information we collect is the date they're added, the information they have, what's going on in their life, because we care about people, and we want to invest our time in people. So please, those bookmarks that you put in your Bible, those lists of people, don't stop. Don't let that stop. Those greeters and visitors bags and reaching out to them and the house to house uh, that we're doing and the new movers baskets, all of those things are a way for us to make contacts. We have monthly door knockings every month. And in fact, we're having one on December the 18th at 2 p.m. We would love to have you there. Those are ways that we can make contacts. And what we're going to do with those contacts is we're going to prospect them and we're going to help evangelize and reach out to them. We're going to sing cards. We're going to do acts of benevolence. We're going to share meals from time to time with people. We're going to invite people into our homes and we're going to do whatever we can in order to reach them. That includes sharing evangelism material with them. And we have plenty of it in the foyer. And if we run out, please ask us for more because this is what we're, we're, we're looking for. And this is what we're searching for is right here. This is Casey earlier this year when he was in our home and we studied for weeks and weeks on end, and even after he was baptized into Christ, uh, we've had other studies too, and we plan on, as soon as his surgeries are over, having more studies. This is what we're looking for. We're looking for, we're looking for Bible studies so that we can have baptisms, and those baptisms are going to lead to more new converts, and those new converts continue that pattern of a growing church. When we look into Scripture... When we look into Scripture, and I I know this is hard to see, when we we look into Scripture, we see so many verses we can focus in talking about missions. 
Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. We see Bible verses that talk about prospects, such as uh, Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, and then again, verses 18 to 23, when it's talking about the soil and how, we, we, how there's, we're sowing the seed and the seed lands on various types of soil. Well, here's the thing we need to think about in that particular account. Just because today the soil might be rocky doesn't mean tomorrow it's going to be. So we keep sowing that seed and we keep getting out there and prospecting every person we can. We keep setting up Bible studies, which means that we are in the word all the time. Second Timothy chapter two and verse 15. We're people that are prepared, that are, that are approved before God. We are working. We're not ashamed. We are rightly dividing the word of truth. We are people that are taking that charge as we're given in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 1 through 5. And we are preaching the gospel day in and day out because that is our mission. Our mission is to preach and to teach and to help seek and save the lost, to bring people to Christ. We want our friends, our family, our neighbors, our co-workers, we want every single one of them to be baptized just as we were, to be baptized just as, just as they were in the first century there in Acts chapter 2, where the, these people asked, what can we do? And the reply was given. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We want people to come to Jesus, to rise and walk in newness of life, as we read about in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. We want that for people, and I hope that you want that for people. We want to take those people, those contacts, those prospects, turn them into Bible studies, turn them into conversions, turn them into new converts, and help continue the pattern of growth here in the church. We see in Acts chapter 9 and verse 31, it says, Then the churches throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. And that same kind of multiplication can happen today if we will all reach out to the lost. There are so many people in our community that need Jesus. Today is a day that we can reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If today you have listened to these reports and you've thought about your own life and your own friends and your own family, if today that you know that maybe we haven't been reaching everybody we could, make today the day that we get back on the mission and we stay on the mission of preaching Christ and him crucified. If there is anything we can do for you, whether prayers to the church or today you want to put on Christ in baptism, please come as we stand and as we sing. I haven't picked up a bulletin make sure you pick up a bulletin there's a there's a list of activities that we're going to be doing the month of December December is like crazy sometimes and I love it uh, always good food good fellowship and everything so don't don't miss the good time that we can have together as a fellowship and a in a loving fa church family here and so uh, uh, look at your bulletin and keep up with the dates and and try to participate in all the things that we have provided for you thank you 
We'll sing the first verse of 599 and then be dismissed in prayer. If there's anyone here this afternoon who may not was able to partake of the Lord's Supper, you may exit at this time and you will be served in B2. In B2. 599, the first verse. <clears throat> oh, how sweet it will be to be the Lord when He comes in. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to this time, this close, of this worship, Lord, thanking you for the blessing you stowed upon us, Lord. Lord, be with us as we take what we've, we've learned today and the spread the seeds that we, we've all carry that would just give us the courage to get out and, and, and broadcast those seeds that, so that they will grow, Lord. Lord, thank you for the pierces. And Brother Pig and their, their work in foreign lands and their report, Lord, continue to be with their, their great works they do. Lord, be with now this, this coming week as we go out and that, that we take what we've learned, Lord. Yes, I pray in your Son's name, Christ Jesus. Amen.